Thank you. It's uh, wonderful to be up here, and I'm thrilled to be invited to speak to everybody with all, all of my esteemed colleagues. Um, so a lot of the slides that I have um, uh, were given to me by my colleague, Dr. Derek Mason. Um, and I think that you should have a printout of most of them in your, uh, in your packet. Um, so some of them have already been sort of discussed uh, by Dr. Pass and others, so I'm gonna, gonna go through them kind of quickly because I know we're short on time. I'll do these questions at the end. These were my multiple choice questions. Okay, so um, a little bit of the background of lung cancer. I think we've been all through this. Um, uh, the, this is um, an estimate of the number of new cases of lung cancer. You can see that for men and women, um, uh, lung cancer is the second uh, most common new cancer uh, um, behind prostate and breast. But if you estimate the number of deaths from cancer, uh, lung cancer is the leading cause of death in both men and women by a significant margin. This is 80 to 90,000 deaths compared to 30 to 40,000 deaths per year. Um, uh, so we touched on this briefly at the beginning, how much history is significant, who should be screened for lung cancer. And if you go strictly by the recommendations of the NLST that was talked about before, it's a 30-pack year smoking history, which is one pack per day uh, for 30 years or two packs a day for 15 years uh, or some multiple thereof, um, age 55 to 74. And uh, we like to screen current smokers or those who have quit within the last 15 years. Um, and then there are some uh, sort of fudge factors for people who have other risk factors such as asbestos exposure, uh, things like that. Um, and it's important to note that in the radiologic community, we're, we're talking a little bit about this, about screening should be discontinued um, once someone hasn't been smoking for 15 years uh, or they develop a significant health problem that would limit their life expectancy. So if you find a uh, sort of an indolent or slow-growing lung cancer that probably won't kill the patient, um, then it might not be worth uh, going through the, the screening process uh, over that. Um, I'll skip through some of these slides. This is a chest x-ray. So what types of tests do, are we talking about? We've talked a lot about chest x-ray, but this is actually what a chest x-ray looks like. So this is a patient getting an x-ray. This is the x-ray tube. Um, the x-ray beam will come out of here, pass through the patient, and into the detector where the patient is standing next to. And uh, these are the images that we get as radiologists. So this is, is the heart in the middle. Um, all of the black here is the lungs uh, around the heart and the the lines here are the ribs, and, the, and this white line down the middle is the spine. Uh, and this is the lateral view, so the patient is turned to the side. And again, you see the heart uh, in the middle of the chest and the lungs around it. Um, this, uh, on the other hand, is a CT scan. So this is a, a big donut-shaped machine. And instead of um, that tube that makes the x-rays being in one spot, it actually spins around the patient, around and around very quickly. Um, and you can't see it inside the machine, but it's using the same x-ray uh, that a regular x-ray would use. It's just moving around the patient. Uh, and then we use a special computer techniques to reconstruct images, uh, uh, 3D images of inside the body. And this is an example um, of the upper part of the lungs. And on this image, uh, we're seeing the lungs here are black. And uh, this is the trachea in the middle, and this is part of the aorta, which is the big blood vessel in the chest. Um, Okay, so uh, we touched a little bit about radiation exposure. Uh, Low-dose screening CTs are on the order of a one millisievert. Uh, to put that in perspective, a typical chest X-ray is 0.1 millisievert, so uh, a low-dose CT is about 10 X-rays. It's in that range. But a regular diagnostic CT, which was done for something a patient has an indication or a symptom that we're trying to look for, is about five millisieverts, so five times more. And then the annual background exposure, just from living, you get about three millisieverts per year. Um, these are the types of things we can see on chest x-ray. Um, this right here, this opacity here, is actually a pleural effusion. So this is fluid around the lung. This big, large triangle here is a mass uh, in the mediastinum of a patient. And this thing out here, this is a mass in the lung in a patient. Um, we were, there was an excellent question before about why not use um, X-ray versus CT, and uh, the NLST proved that X-ray is a superior test to CT, uh, that, I'm sorry, that CT is a superior test to X-ray in detecting lung cancer, and this is why. So this is, this is an X-ray. Can you see the abnormality? It's very, very faint. So there's a little bit of hazy stuff right here, okay? So that's actually a lung cancer. And you could see how easy that could be to, to not detect. But when the patient had a CT, 
here's what the nodule looks like on a CT, and this is not easy to miss. This is very clear that there's something abnormal going on here. Here's another example. Okay, here's a chest X-ray. I personally have looked at this 10 times. I can't find, I can't find the nodule, but there is a nodule here, which you can't see, but here it is on the CT. So this is the reason why the NLST found that CT is so much better than X-ray and, and why we should use CT to screen patients. Okay, uh, we went through a lot of this. Um, uh, Dr. Pass mentioned the US uh, Preventive Services Task Force. They gave a B recommendation for screening. Um, and what that did is, is basically it's prompting most private insurers now to start covering screening. Uh, that's expected to happen in January of this year, so just uh, January of next year, I guess, so just in a few months. Um, most private insurances will start covering screening CTs. And then next week, actually, he mentioned that Medicare had made a decision not to cover uh, screening CTs. So that decision was deferred, and uh, they're making a final decision on November 10th. So just one week away, uh, and they'll make the final decision, and we're, we're all hoping that they they choose the right way. Um, what types of things do you want to ex expect when you're having a, uh, if you're having a screening CT? Well, it's, it's actually pretty straightforward. There's no preparation needed. There's no special diet. There's, you don't have to fast. There's no IV. We don't use intravenous contrast. So there's no needles involved. And most times patients come in uh, to get their CT, they don't even have to change clothes. Um, you can wear the clothes off your street, uh, off the street. You just lie down on the table. Um, once you're on the table, you move through the machine, uh, and the examination is done in a single breath hold. So the machine will say, take a deep breath in, you move through, and it's done. Um, okay, uh, some of the potential drawbacks of CT screening. Again, Dr. Pass uh, mentioned some of these things. A lot of them are the false positives. So we see lots of nodules, uh, and the vast majority of nodules that we see are not lung cancer. But we see them, and we have to decide what to do the, with them. Do we biopsy them? Do we follow them up in a few months? Do we do a different test, like a PET-CT scan, to see how active the nodule is? Um, and all of those things add cost to the patient, and they also add a great deal of patient anxiety. So nobody wants to have an abnormal scan. Um, and uh, so that is one of the, again, one of the major drawbacks of the, the CT screening. So what, what are we looking for as radiologists when we read these? We're looking for nodules. Lung cancers start out as small nodules, um, and we talk about them as being either solid or ground glass nodules. And nodules can grow um, uh, rapidly or slowly. And we don't know what's going to happen on one scan. We don't know what the future will bring, and that's why we need to follow them over time. In general, stability is a good thing. So if it's a solid nodule, once we've seen it stable for two years, if it hasn't changed at all, then we can say it's definitely benign. There's no chance that this nodule is a cancer. We don't usually know what it's from. Maybe it's from an old infection or an old bit of inflammation, but it's not a cancer. And the exception to the rule is something called a ground glass nodule. So these are um, nodules which can grow very slowly. They can uh, they can be cancer, but they don't grow very quickly. Um, and when we see those, those require a much longer follow-up. Um, here's some examples of what they look like on the images. So this is a ground glass nodule here. You can see this sort of faint, hazy white stuff here. The fact that you can see a little bit of black or a little bit of normal lung through it makes it a ground glass nodule, as opposed to something like a solid nodule, which is here. It's much more dense, much more white and solid looking. Okay, so this, in general, would be something that's more aggressive, something that's going to grow faster than this, okay? Um, if something is found on the screening CT, what happens? What do we do? So we as radiologists, we first thing we do is do our best to classify it. Uh, how likely do we think that it is a cancer? Definitely benign, probably benign, indeterminate, maybe malignant, or definitely malignant. And the more worrisome the nodule, obviously, um, the shorter the term follow-up will be, or uh, we may end up recommending an, an, inter, uh, an immediate intervention, uh, such as a biopsy. Um, there are a number of different guidelines. Uh, this is a really active uh, discussion going on in the radiologic community right now, is, is how do we define uh, what nodules are concerning and what are not concerning and how often we need to follow them up. A lot of people have been using something called the Fleischner Society guidelines. Those have been around for about 10 years. Um, 
Uh, and just recently, within the last year, they're developing a new set of guidelines called lung RADs. Uh, you got, maybe you have heard of the BIRAD system in mammography. So if you get a mammogram, they'll give you a number BIRADs 1, BIRADs 2, something like that. So we're working to develop a similar system for lung cancer screening where we can say your lung RADs is 1, your lung RADs is 2, that kind of thing. And uh, the most important take-home point, uh, if any of you are considering getting screened, is that a request for a follow-up on a screening CT does not mean that you have lung cancer. Like uh, Dr. Pass was saying, the vast majority of nodules that we see are benign nodules. They are not cancer. So most nodules we see are not cancer, and request a follow-up does not mean that you have lung cancer, okay? Um, if you do have a nodule, um, it's what's, what happens next? So we talked, he already talked a little bit about surgery, uh, percutaneous biopsy, which is sticking a needle into it. Another test that your doctor might order is something called a PET-CT. That's a specialized uh, nuclear medicine exam. Um, unlike a regular CT, that one does require um, uh, some patient preparation. They'll give you very specific instructions on uh, when to eat and when not to eat before the test, how long you have to fast. Um, and when you come in for the test, you're injected with a small amount of a radioactive uh, tracer, which mimics glucose. And glucose is the main source of uh, energy for all of the cells in your body, for the tumor cells and for normal cells in your body. Um, and once you get the injection, you sit in a, in a room uh, for an hour, maybe a little bit more than an hour, while the, the tracer circulates through your body. And then they put you on the PET-CT scan, and they take the images. Um, and those take uh, on the order of minutes. Uh, not just seconds, like a regular CT. This is what a PET CT looks like. So um, this is the PET portion of the exam, and you can see this black thing here. This is the lung cancer. Uh, this means the, the fact that it's so black means it's very metabolically active. It's an active, uh, it's an active piece of tissue here. And this is the corresponding CT that comes with it, and you can't tell activity. You can't tell how aggressive something is on a CT uh, but you can get much better anatomic information uh, based on the CT than the PET. You can see this is, it's much easier to see the parts of the body on this image than this image. So it used to be that these were totally separate exams and patients would have them done at separate times, but now they've put the PET next to the CT and they're actually all on the same table and patients will go through both at the same time. And when that happens, we can do something like this which is um, a PET-CT fused image. So we can actually overlay the PET image directly on top of the CT image. And you, what this image is showing is sort of the, the red or the orange stuff. That's the metabolically active cells in the body, okay? And it's overlaid on top of the anatomy, which is from the CT. So the anatomy is the spine and the bones and things like that, we can see. And in this patient, this here is the liver which is normally an active uh, structure. These are the kidneys. This is the bladder, which is filling up. Patient has to, has to go pee. And then this here is the lung cancer. And you can see that it's so orange, it's so bright, that means that it's a very active cancer, okay? Um, when we do these screening CTs, what other things can be found on them? So when we image, we scan the whole chest, basically, and we can look at everything in the chest, not just the lungs, not just for lung cancer. We can look at the heart, at the vessels, uh, at the breasts, at all kinds of things. Uh, and we do often find things in patients. So this is what a normal CT would look like. This is what a, a patient with emphysema would look like. So all of this sort of black holes in the lungs here, this is emphysema. And this is not an uncommon finding in patients who are, are having screening CTs with a smoking history. Um, when we scan through the bottom of the lungs, we also include a few slices of the upper abdomen as well. Uh, in this case here, this turns out to be um, a kidney cancer. Okay, so this was a screening CT, but we included a little bit of the kidney here and we found this cancer here. So this patient was fortunate to have that diagnosis made for them. And this here, um, this is a very subtle finding, uh, but I'll tell you that this soft tissue here is the breast, and here's the other breast, and this faint little opacity here, that's a breast cancer. Okay, so when we're looking at these, our, you know, our primary goal is, is looking at nodules and uh, looking for lung cancer, but when we read them, we look at everything else as well be because of this exact reason, because there are so many other things that we see, so many other findings that we can make that may potentially uh, help the patient. Okay, so 
Um, if you're listening and uh, you're interested in getting screened, how do you do it? So most major medical centers now in the area have screening programs. Uh, they all have information on their websites. You can talk to your primary care physician. Uh, this is the information for the NYU screening program. There's a phone number and there's also a website with information. All right, now here's my, my follow-up questions. So these are all true false questions. So uh, the first statement, chest CT is superior to chest X-ray in the detection of lung cancer. Is that true or false? Is it working? It's not recording any. Please hold. <laughs> I can just give you the answer. Let's see. All right, we'll try this and see if that works. Okay. Okay, try clicking now. Let's see if that works. No? Okay, that's all right. All right. <laughs> all right. So do you want to just shout it out? Chest CT is superior. True, right. Chest CT is superior to chest X-ray in the detection of lung cancer. All right. Uh, Screening chest CT examinations are universally covered by insurance and Medicare. So that's false, right? But hopefully that's changing in the near future. For private insurance, January 1st is the big day, and for Medicare next week we'll find out their, uh, their decision. Um, okay, good. And most lung nodules are due to lung cancer. False, right? Most lung, most lung nodules are not lung cancer. Good. All right, so um, in conclusion, uh, we went through um, most of these things. Um, uh, I gave some examples of what radiologists are looking for on these screening CTs, and uh, reimbursement is coming, and, um, and that's it. Great. Thank you.